you got your Bibles? We, we've got to bring our Bibles to church, don't we? This is our, hey, listen, this is the guide right here. This is our map. This is whatever terminology you want to use. This is the Word of God. And uh, we love the Lord, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Praise God. So tonight we're going to start something uh, new for the next several weeks, and I'll go ahead and make this announcement now. We're going to use Wednesday nights to uh, do questions and answers, and I've already had you know uh, several questions that have been uh, presented to me, and we're going to try and do that. And if you have a question, a Bible question, uh, please don't ask me about astrophysics or something like that, because I'm not going to be able to answer that. Uh, but if you have a question related to the Bible or anything related to you know, life and the Bible, if, if there's a connection there, um, uh, you know, those type of things, then write them out on a sheet of paper. Please put your name with it uh, so I know who it's coming from and hand it to me. You can do that after tonight's service or any service, and we'll go through these in order, and uh, we'll try and answer as many questions as we can. Again, it, it, it's got to be in accordance with God's Word. Amen? If it's not in accordance with God's Word, then uh, we're off track. And it's really important that we understand that and that we recognize that. Now, as we begin tonight, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to ask you to begin by turning with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And we are going to use our Bibles tonight. I'm going to have you turn. I'm not just going to read all the scriptures to you. I'm going to have you use your Bible tonight. Um, And so uh, plan on doing that. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this, is our, this will be our theme verse for the entirety of the time that we go through questions and answers. Um, so this will probably come back to this again and again. This is our theme verse. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable. Get this now. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God, and this is man there means mankind, so man or the woman of God, may be, it says adequate in my version, but it doesn't mean adequate, sometimes it means just average. That's not what it means. The word here means be, be complete, all right? So that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Not just some scripture, not just parts of it, but all of it from Genesis to Revelation. I want you to keep that in mind as we begin to go through some of these questions and answers this evening with the Lord's help. All right, so that's our theme verse. And let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord to help us. We want to do the scriptures tell us in uh, Peter, for instance, Peter says that there are some that take the scriptures out of context and they kind of distort the scriptures to their own destruction. We want to make sure we do not do that. We want to rightly divide, in other words, rightly understand the scriptures. Amen? From, again, from Genesis to Revelation, we're taking nothing out of context. We want to do no violence as it was to God's word, meaning ripping a verse out of its context to make it say something it doesn't. We want to pray, Lord, lead us tonight. Help us to understand and grow. This will be a great opportunity for all of us here to be a little bit better of a Bible student than maybe when we came in will be a little bit better when we leave. Amen? So let's pray on that note. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, I pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, we do pray, sincerely pray, that we never do uh, any violence to your word, mean, meaning that we take it out of context, Lord, that we uh, rip it out of its, uh, its original meaning, Lord, that, that we take something to mean one thing when it clearly means something else. Tonight, what we pray is lead us by your Spirit, Lord, give us a clarity of mind and a clarity of heart to understand and to recognize truth and error, to be able to to discern the difference between truth and error. And Father, we will thank you and we'll believe you. We'll trust you in all of these things for you are a, a wonderful, a loving Heavenly Father. And we thank you for your word that you've given to us tonight. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells within each and every believer. And we will just give you the honor and the glory for leading our Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. And amen. So several questions. This first question uh, relates to a scripture found in the book of Isaiah. 
So if you want to go to the book of Isaiah, let me quickly tell you, almost every Bible in the front of the Bible will have a table of contents. If you don't know where a book of the Bible is, go to the front of your Bible and you'll find a table of contents and you can find these different books of the Bible. We're going to go to Isaiah and we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 14. And I want to set the stage for us before we read the verse. Isaiah chapter 14. And this is the question. The question is, are Satan and Jesus somehow related according to a verse in Isaiah chapter 14? And we'll, I'll give you the actual verse in a moment. But the reason this question is asked is because there are some cults, Mormonism in particular, that actually teaches, believe it or not, that Jesus and Lucifer, Satan, were somehow brothers in heaven before the earth was even formed and made, and uh, that Lucifer presented one plan to God the Father, if you would, uh, on how to redeem mankind, and Jesus presented another plan, and of course God the Father chose Jesus' plan, so Lucifer got mad and said, I'm going to try and mess all this up. So this is, the, this is actually the, the teaching of Mormonism, and there are others that get into all kinds of trouble because they do not properly divide the word of truth. They don't understand and interpret the Bible properly. So the verse is Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. And it says this, How you have fallen from heaven. If you have a King James, it says, O Lucifer, which is the star of the morning, the sun of the dawn. You have been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. Now, the reason that some people get off on this is they say, wait, Lucifer here is being described as the morning star or the sun of the dawn. And I thought Jesus was the morning star, according to the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 16. And it is true. Jesus is the bright morning star. And people then question and say, well, wait a minute. Does this mean they're related somehow? Well, let's go ahead and clarify this. Number one, let's talk about what is the morning star. First of all, if you just know astronomy at all, the morning star or the evening star is actually the planet Venus because it's the brightest illumination other than the moon when the moon is full or whatever, it's going to be the brightest, quote, star. It's a planet, but the brightest star in the heavens. So the first star you see generally at night, most of the time, is actually the planet Venus. And the last one you see just before sunrise is the planet Venus most of the time. It's shining brightest. Why is that? Well, it's closest to us. Planet Venus is, is, is close to the earth, and so it makes sense that it would shine out. And so we have this terminology, morning star. So this bright, the brightest of the stars as it was in the heavens. So, let, so let's get that down, and now let's talk about this verse. There are a couple things you need to understand about Isaiah chapter 14 and verse 12. First of all, the chapter itself is actually God pronouncing judgment on an earthly king, the king of, of Babylon at this time, but there's also a secondary meaning referring to Satan, who was before... He became Satan. He was actually an angel in heaven. He was an archangel in heaven. Ark meaning one of the top angels in heaven. This is, and this is what we're told. And so we have this dual meaning here in Isaiah 14 and verse 12. In fact, we could even go forward and, and maybe go to, let's say, verse 10 and start this way in verse 10 and read it in context. They will all respond and say to you, to this, this shining one, even you have been made weak as we, you have become like us. Your pomp and the music of your harps have been brought down to hell, to Sheol. Maggots are spread, are spread out as your bed beneath you, and worms are your covering. Verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven. In other words, this is the king of Babylon was the greatest person at that time or most mighty on the face of the earth. And Lucifer was one of the archangels in heaven. And so we're reading here, how you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, meaning star of the morning, sun of the dawn. You've been cut down to the earth, you who have weakened the nations. But you said in your heart, verse 13, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God, and I will sit on the mount of the assembly in the recesses of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Nevertheless, you're actually going to be cast down, verse 15 begins. You're saying of yourself, I'm this, 
But the truth is, you're going to come down. So again, talking to the king of Babylon, and of course the kingdom of Babylon is no more, is it? At one time, it was the mightiest kingdom on the face of the earth. And now it is no more, and the king was the mightiest on the earth. But there's this secondary meaning because we're literally seeing someone that is saying, you know what, I was up in heaven, and I aspired in my heart to be like God, to take God off his throne. And many commentators believe, and I think there is definitely reference here, to who we now call Satan. Before he fell, he just decided, I'm going to be like God one day. He's an angel. He's a created being. But he says, I'm not content being an angel. I want to take God's place. And of course, he was cast down, and he became Satan as we know him today. He is now a fallen angel. So now the question is, the, the, the King James puts this word in here in verse, tw- in verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven, Lucifer. And, and the, the King James, New King James uses it as well, but the actual, <laughs> you understand that the Old Testament was written in what language? Was it written in English? Was there such a thing as English when the Old Testament was written? It was written thousands of years ago, way before English. It was written in Hebrew. That was the language of the Jewish people. In Hebrew, in the language it was written in, the actual word is Hilal, and it actually means light bearer, or it can mean sun of the morning. It can mean bright, shining star, because that's, that's what it is. And so actually, in the King James, what they did, you say, how did they come up with the word Lucifer? If that's not the translation from Hebrew to English, then how did they come up with that word? Well, before we ever got our English versions of the Bible... There was a Latin version. And this man named Jerome came out with the Latin Vulgate. In other words, translating the Old Testament in Hebrew, the New Testament was written in Greek, translating that into Latin. All right? And in Latin, the word halal, Hebrew, for light bearer, is basically Lucifer or something close to that. So when the King James writers, the English writers, were, got here to, to Isaiah 14, 12, they said, yeah, that, that name Lucifer sounds pretty cool. Instead of translating it morning star or light bearer, let's keep that word Lucifer because it kind of just sounds, you know, that's, that's our word that we've been using for hundreds of years, even though it's a Latin word. And so the King James writers kept the word Lucifer. The actual word in the Hebrew is halal, and it actually means light bearer, or it means sun of the morning or star of the morning. That's what it means, okay? And so that's why in the King James you have Lucifer, but in newer versions they say, no, we're going to take the Hebrew and translate it right to English, and so the word is actually star of the morning, that's, or light bearer. That's what the word means. And so that's why some Bibles say Lucifer, some do not, but then people say, well, even if it's Son of the morning, the the morning star, that's Jesus. Jesus is the bright morning star. Revelation 22, 16 says that. Jesus is the bright morning star. And here it's Lucifer. There must be a connection. Is there some kind of connection? Are they somehow related? You know? No, they're not. All you have to do is read this in context, folks, and you understand very, very clearly that it cannot be in any way talking about Jesus or anything related to Jesus because Jesus is God. This is talking about a created being that wants to be God but cannot be God and is cast down. Jesus is God. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Jesus is eternally God. So this is not talking about Jesus and there is no relation. You say, well, then why, why is this Word used that this guy is like the bright morning star, which is you know, what Jesus is in the New Testament? Because remember the Apostle Paul when he was writing to the Corinthians and he was talking about Satan and he's talking about how the devil comes and tries to trip us up? And he says to the Corinthians that Satan appears sometimes as what? An angel of light. Satan comes and disguises himself as an angel of light. Satan always wants to imitate Jesus. He wants to duplicate so he can deceive people. So it's no surprise here that that Lucifer, again, I'm using that that Latin word as well because we're so used to it, before he became Satan, before he fell in heaven, it's no surprise that he would say, I want to be the bright morning star. I want to be this person, and I'm going to lift myself up. And if you actually look earlier in the chapter, what you actually see is that this is really more of a taunt. It's God saying, oh, this is who you think you are? 
You can talk all you want, buddy, but this is not who you are. You coming down to the earth. I'm going to smack you down to, to use you know, language today. And that's exactly what happened. And so there is no relationship here simply because the word means bright morning star or morning star. It does not mean that there's any relationship. Satan is a created being. He is not God's equal. Do we understand that? God has no equal. There is no equal to God. God is the creator. Everything comes from him. Everything else is created. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So, so Satan cannot be related to in any way or linked to Jesus, and that is not what the Scriptures are telling us here. Again, if you look at verse 15, nevertheless you'll be cast down to Sheol, to the recesses of the pit. Is that going to happen to Jesus? That's not going to happen to Jesus. He's delivered us from those things. And so we know that there is absolutely no connection there at all. All right? Other than Lucifer being the one that wants to imitate the light, but he is not the light. So the answer is, are they related in any way? No. And anyone that teaches such is 100% taking the scriptures out of context and teaching something that is false. Amen? Okay. So that one we've, we've got covered. Another question. The Bible says God cannot look at evil. How is it that Satan was face to face with God in the book of Job? Okay, so let's go to the book of Job. Let's go to Job chapter 1. Job chapter 1, it'll be right before the Psalms. If you were in Isaiah, just start turning back towards the front of your Bible, but just a few books. You'll pass Proverbs and pass Psalms, and then you come to the book of Job. Not Job. I know it's our word for job, but it's actually pronounced Job. So, so we've got the, the, the book of Job here. By the way, I think I've told you guys this, that when I first started going to a Christian school in high school, I went from a, you know, a secular school, regular school in uh, junior high to a high school, we had to take Bible, and everyone had to do devotions. And I, I really didn't know the Bible that well. I knew it, but I didn't know it. And I thought I was going to be really cool. I was going to go to the Old Testament to do my devotions. Very first devotions I did, I found this Old Testament book, the last book of the Old Testament. And I got up and I said, I'm going to ask you if you would turn in your Bibles to the book of Malachi. <laughs> it sounded Italian to me. The book is actually Malachi, but I butchered that and said Malachi. Very first, you know. So this is not Job, it is the book of Job. So we go to the book of Job, and we do find something very interesting. We kind of get some insight into what goes on in heaven. Have you ever wondered some of the things that go on in heaven? The book of Job gives us something here. It's very, very interesting. So it, it begins, and it tells us about this man named Job that lives in the land, and he's blameless, verse 1 says. He's upright. He fears God. He's got a wonderful family. He's got everything that, that he could imagine. And, and you know, he, he's living out his life and doing what he's doing. And we come to verse 6, and we read something interesting. Now, there was a day when the sons of God came in to, came in to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, Old Testament sons of God does not mean what it means in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we are sons and daughters of God. In the Old Testament, sons of God pretty much always refers to angels, to angelic beings. So when we read this in verse 6, this is angels coming and presenting themselves before God in heaven, and Satan, being a fallen angel, has access to heaven apparently and comes before God. And the Lord said to Satan, where would you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? No one like him on all the, on, in all the earth. Blameless, upright, God-fearing man, all these kind of things. And then, and then we go into this. I'm not going to go into it, but then Satan begins to accuse and say, well, Job only serves you because he's getting stuff from you or he's fearful, all this different stuff. And we get into, this, into the book of Job. But the point is, Satan actually appears before God, before heaven, and he's there as the accuser of righteous people. He wants to come and accuse righteous people and get God angry. He's hoping to get God angry or, or something with, with people that are righteous. And, and so the question becomes, well, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say God cannot look on evil? So how in the world could Satan, who is evil, be in the presence of God? And there's actually a very simple answer to this. 
And the answer, we read in Job that Satan absolutely appears before God in heaven. This, this has happened. Some debate on whether he still does or not. We won't get into that. But it did happen. Satan was there as it was, if you would, face to face with God in heaven. But we read now, we go to actually toward the back of our Bible to another Old Testament book, Habakkuk. Habakkuk. So I know I told you we were going to use our Bibles, and we are. So let's go to Habakkuk. You just turn through, and it's again Old Testament. It's what we call one of the minor prophets. All right? So it's on page uh, 1346 in my Bible, not in yours probably. But go to this little Old Testament book of Habakkuk, and this is actually, there's a simple answer to this question. The Bible says God can't look on evil. How could Satan appear before God uh, in, in the book of Job? So Habakkuk chapter 1, this is where this, ha this thought has to come from. Verse 13. This is talking about the Lord. Thine eyes are too pure to look at or approve of evil. You cannot look on wickedness. And then in some versions it says with favor, which is trying to translate what the thought there is. But it says literally in the Hebrew, you cannot look on wickedness. Your eyes don't behold evil, right? And so people say, well, God's not looking at evil. How could Satan appear there? This is a really simple thing. The verse is not saying what we think it does when we only take one little verse and only half of the verse and we read it that way because there's a remainder to the verse, isn't there? Is the verse end there with you cannot look upon uh, wickedness? No. It goes on. Why do you look with favor on those who deal treacher treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? All right, so actually, here's the deal. The Bible is not saying that God cannot look upon evil. Actually, he's God. He knows everything. He sees everything. Doesn't matter what it is. He knows what's going on in hell. He knows what's going on in our lives. He knows everything. So this, this scripture is not saying that. What's happening is Habakkuk is speaking for the people who, who in their minds, they look at the way that the unrighteous prosper. Have you ever done that and wondered, how come that guy who's so slimy gets away with everything? Why isn't God dealing with this person? What is this that's going on? And so Habakkuk is speaking from the human perspective saying, God, I know you don't put up with evil. I know you can't stand to look at evil. So what's going on? But then he goes on, he says, but you know what? I know you do see it. You do see what's going on. And so the, the, the answer here is very simple. It's not saying that, that God's eyes are too pure to look upon sin, but it's actually saying it's too, his eyes are so pure that it will not look on sin and then tolerate it. That's what it's saying. God, you will not tolerate this forever. Not that you can't see it or don't see it, you do. But the point is, I know you will not tolerate this forever. And we know that if we actually went to chapter 2, we would see that in verses uh, 2 and 3. The Lord answered and said, Record the vision, inscribe it on tablets, that the one who reads it may run. Now get this, for the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal, and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for, it's certain, for it will certainly come, it will not delay. So what God is saying is, listen, I've got everything planned out. Wicked people will not always have the upper hand. Sometimes in this life, God deals with the wicked. And he actually, boom, hits them in this life and everyone sees it. But the New Testament so says that some people's sins go before them, meaning, in other words, that it's like it, it's out there, it's exposed. We've seen that before, where sometimes people in this life, they don't get away with it. And the justice system comes in or someone comes in and all of a sudden, boom, there it is out in the open. But there are other people that from the human perspective seem to get away with it. But God says they're not really getting away with it because there's a final judgment that is coming. And in that final judgment before God, everyone will give an account. And God will look and he sees and he understands. So the, the deal is not that God cannot behold evil or see evil. He just doesn't approve of it. And so what we have in this instance is someone has looked at half of a verse, literally, and said, well, it says that God can't look on sin or evil, and here's Satan appearing before God. Uh, this just doesn't make sense. All you have to do is read the verse and read a little bit of context, right? And it clears up very, very quickly for us, doesn't it? Because it doesn't mean that God can't look on it. It means he will not look on it and approve of it. He will deal with it one day. 
He will deal with all sin, all unrighteousness one day. Amen? So that's actually the answer to that one. Now, another one that we get to here. And this is, uh, this is a very important one to me. Really critical. And we have to make sure we get this right. Okay? The Bible says not to eat pork. Why do Christians disobey that? <laughs> and I go to Sonny's. And I eat pork all the time. And I love barbecue pork. So I want to take a few minutes here, and we actually want to, want to deal with this one. So again, with your Bibles, one more time now, I'm going to have you go all the way back toward the front of your Bible to the book of Leviticus. Okay, let's go to the book of Leviticus. That's going to be the third book in the Bible, and we're going to chapter 11. Leviticus chapter 11. Leviticus is a book that is basically the law of God coming through Moses. Remember, remember the story of the Exodus? How God's people were in Egypt and they were slaves and God, through Moses, he took them out and he was taking them to the promised land. The book of Leviticus is God speaking through Moses to the people and saying, okay, now you're going to be my people and I'm going to set down some, some laws here. This, you know, you're not going to live like the Egyptians lived and like these other people. I, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing the law down here. And that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. And so we go to chapter 11 and let's just look at verses 7 and 8. Leviticus chapter 11, verses 7 and 8. This is the Lord talking about certain animals that they're not allowed to, to eat from. Verse two, let's look at verse 2. Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, These are the creatures which you may eat from all the animals that are on the earth. All right? And then he's going to, and, and he tells them that. And then afterwards he says in verse 4, Nevertheless, you are not to eat of these all right, and then he's going to go through that, and we get to verse 7, and this is one of the creatures that God calls unclean that they're not allowed to eat from. And the pig, that's pork, <laughs> in case you didn't know. And the pig, for though it divides the hoof, thus making a split hoof, it doesn't chew its cud. It is unclean for you. You shall not eat of their flesh, nor touch their carcasses. They are unclean to you. So, What's going on here? The Bible is telling, God is telling the Israelites, you not to eat of the pig, and not only the pig, but actually a whole bunch of animals here in Leviticus chapter 11. In fact, what Leviticus 11 does is it breaks species up into land, sea, and air. And within that, God says with each species, there are pure animals you can eat, and then there are impure animals and abominable animals that are an abomination that you, you better not touch them or eat them. I, so I'm giving you, I'm kind of, you know, restricting your diet. So I'm going to be going to the doctor here soon. And once again, he'll try and restrict my diet. And once again, I will probably fail to obey some of those restrictions. But this is God speaking to Israel, and he is saying you cannot eat the pig. And so what we have here in chapter 11 is, is a category and criteria for the animals you can eat and the animals you cannot eat. Real quickly, what are they? In verses 2 through, two through 8, we've got the land animals. You can eat these, you can't eat these. Verses 9 through 12, we've got sea creatures, fish, and all those type of animals that live in the sea. In verses 13 through 19, we've got birds. There are some you can eat and there are some you can't eat. We know that God actually fed them with quail, so we know some birds are okay, but the other birds that God says you can't eat these. And then, even in verses 20 to 23, there are winged in insects. There are winged in insects that, and some of them God says, okay, if you want to partake, some of us would be like, man, that's, that's too hardcore. But, but there were some that they could eat, and then there's some that they cannot eat. And so we, we have that uh, broken up for us. And now we come to, to this issue of why did God say that? Why did he say they couldn't, for our purposes, why can't you eat the pig? Why can't you eat pork? And, and so what, what this is really all about is God saying, I want you to be my particular people. The word holy actually means set apart. And God says, you are now my people. I'm going to set you apart, and I'm going to do that by not only internally doing things, but also externally. I want you to be different than the other nations. And a part of that is your diet. I'm going to restrict your diet. And we say, and so, of course, what's the question, right? Come on, what's the question all of you have for why God said not pigs? It's a one-word question. What is it? Why? All of us want to know, why? Why did God say that? 
Why? What has God got against pigs? He created pigs. Why would he say that? And here's the deal, folks. Chapter 11, you're going to say, now give us the verse, Pastor, that, t- that tells us why God said this. <laughs> it's not there. What's, what, what's not in the Bible is not in the Bible. And I've got news for you. There are times that God the Creator says, I want you to do something or not do something, and He is not obliged to tell us why. Any more than our parents were obliged to tell us when we were two years old why we shouldn't stick the fork into the electrical outlet. Our little two-year-old brain couldn't figure out electricity could kill us. We couldn't understand it even if they explained it to us. It's just, no, don't do this. Why can't I go out and play in the street? You know, a toddler. Because the cars will kill you, but it doesn't matter. We don't even understand it, and we don't have to. There are times where God just simply... So now, I'm going to present to you just a couple of different commentaries and things on, well, why? Is there a reason? Maybe there is. Of course, one of those might be health. It might be as simple as that. We got somebody here that will eat a steak 30 seconds on the grill, and that's all. And, and to them, if it's over 30 seconds, it, it's, it's too burned. They literally want it mooing. And, and how many steaks have you eaten over the years that way? How many? You don't know. Quite a few. And you are still alive, and you're still with us. Interestingly enough, you would not want to take that same deal with a pig and eat pork completely raw. You know why? Because there's a lot more potential for bacteria and different things to kill you if you eat pork and it's not been cooked versus eating cow that's, that's maybe not been cooked. There actually is a difference there. So some commentators say, well, God was doing this to protect the Israelites because he knew what they didn't know about the potential for damage to their system if they didn't cook it enough. And so that's, that's one possibility. Um, honestly, again, we're, we're not sure. It could just be as simple as God in here. Maybe he's just contrasting holiness in life versus impurity and death by just saying to the Israelites, I'm going to reduce down the number of things that you're going to be allowed to eat because, again, I want to show you that there's a straight path to heaven and then there's a broader path to hell. And so by doing that, I'm going to restrict your diet by saying, now you people are my people. Boom, we're going to go the straight way. It could be just as simple as that. We really, I'm being honest with you folks, we don't know. By the way, the other thing that we do see here, interestingly enough, is it does seem that for that period of time in the Old Testament, what God was saying about the animals that they could eat, and therefore they had to slaughter them to eat them. Sorry to break your heart if you didn't know that. But it was the most humane way to do it. And God talks about draining the blood, a lot of things there. So there, there's a lot in this that we just don't know because God doesn't tell us exactly why. But here's the deal. It doesn't matter if he doesn't tell us why. God told the Israelites, not all of mankind, this wasn't for everybody, it's for the Israelites. He said, I don't want you to eat certain flesh. That's just that's what I'm telling you to do. And so you say, well, what's the takeaway from this? The takeaway is that Leviticus 11 reminds us that God does not always provide detailed explanations for his commands. And again, what makes us think he owes us that? What makes us think the created, that the creator owes us explanations for everything that he asks us to do? He actually doesn't. He doesn't owe us any of those explanations. Remember Adam and Eve? They flunked their test of obedience. God said, hey, you can eat of any tree except one tree. I actually did kind of tell them why. You know, the day, day you eat of it, you're going to die. But they didn't know what death meant. They had no clue what that meant at all. Really, they didn't. And they flunked the test of obedience. Then we fast forward in, in that first book of the Bible, Genesis, to another guy, Abraham. And God actually, in, in contrast to Adam and Eve, the Lord tests Abraham by, to us it seems inexplicable. He commands Abraham to take his only son that God's given to him and sacrifice him to the Lord. That's like against everything that God would say. Now, he didn't have to do that, right? But God wanted to test his heart and see if he would be fully faithful, and Abraham was. And, of course, his son, he didn't have to sacrifice his son. But, folks, there are, there are times here when, when God says, I want to see the highest form of obedience possible in you, and that is radical submission 
of our human judgment to divine will. Where we just say, it doesn't matter because I'm only human and God is divine and whatever he says goes. Period. End of discussion. That, that's real, actual obedience to the Lord. The highest form of beautiful obedience to the Lord is when God says no and he doesn't give us the answer, but we just say, I know, K-N-O-W, that you know best. So if you say no, I'm not going to do it. If you say yes, I'll do it. You know better than I do. That's what's going on here in Leviticus chapter 11. Can I just give you maybe an example from, from real life? One morning, a lady named May Nelson was walking with her three small children along a dusty road in Australia. And at one point, as they were walking, she just said, Children, stand still. I mean, as strong and as loud as she could. Children, stand still. Boom. They all stopped right there on the spot. They, they froze just like statues. And they didn't know why. Then they saw this six-foot, lethal, deadly brown snake only inches from the shoes of the eldest child go across the pathway, and as they stood still, it just slithered along its way from one side to the other and went harmlessly into the, the brush. Mom didn't have time to tell them why to stand still. They didn't need to know why. Can you imagine if they had said, well, Mom, we don't want to stand still? Boom. They're dead, and actually the world would have been robbed of a great concert pianist named Allison Nelson, who was one of those children that day. But instead, the children stood still because mom said so. Sometimes God just says, hey, stand still. And we just need to stand still. Amen? Amen? So now that's all the Old Testament. That's really not the question, Pastor. The, the question is, the Old Testament tells us not to do it. Why are you eating pork, man? You're disobeying the Bible. Okay, here's the deal. The key question is, why are Christians allowed to do this? Or why do some Christians do it? Because we also have a New Testament. And if we go to the New Testament in our Bible, which supersedes the Old Testament for Christians? The New Testament is the final revelation of God's will and his work in our lives. If we go to one more scripture, I'm going to have you go to Acts chapter 10 in the New Testament. The book of Acts chapter 10, we're going to see something else. So we've seen what the Old Testament says. The Old Testament, absolutely. If you're an Israelite, if you're a Jew, you better not eat pork. You're disobeying what God says. But we're not Jews. And even if I was a Jew as a Christian, if I become a Christian, my Christianity outranks my ethnicity. But Acts chapter 10. And we've got a, a, a guy who is a Jew of Jews. His name is Peter. The Apostle Peter. And he loves Jesus, and he wants to serve Jesus with, with all of his heart. Jesus has already died, been resurrected, gone back to heaven, and he's told Peter, I want you to be one of the leaders of the church. I want you to feed my sheep, do all this stuff. So Peter is doing that. He's trying to serve the Lord. And we're in Acts chapter 10, and we're just going to read verses 9 through 16. we got some people coming to Peter. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, and he became hungry. And was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance. So people are, are, are making food. The chefs are doing all their stuff. And he falls into a trance. And behold, in the, sky, the sky opens up and a certain object like a great sheet came down, lowered by four corners to the ground. So it's like a big bed sheet. Somebody's holding on to all four corners and it's brought down low. And there were in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him and said, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. Verse 14. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, you tried to trick me. For I have never eaten anything unholy or unclean. I'm a good Jew. I know what Leviticus says. And this is a trick. You're trying to get me to eat something that you've said I'm not supposed to eat. Again, verse 15. A voice came a second time. What God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. And this happened three times, and immediately the object was taken up into the sky. So now, let me tell you something. First of all, the bigger context of this is God was trying to get Peter's attention that it's not just the Jews that are going to receive the gospel, but the unclean Gentiles. How many here are Gentiles? Do you know if you're a Gentile or a Jew? You would probably know if you're a Jew. If you're not sure, you're a Gentile. 
So, so all of us, the Jews would consider us unclean. You know, we're, we're the heathen. And God wants to get Peter's attention and say, hey, all these animals that have come down in the sheet, I'm telling you that they're all clean. None of them are unclean. And he's saying to Peter, you can go ahead and, and kill one and eat it. It's okay. The pig that's sitting right there, that Sonny's pig that with the barbecue sauce, I'm telling you it's okay to eat this. And I'm serious. Now, the, the picture here is for the Lord saying, you can go to the Gentiles. In fact, I'm sending some of them to your house, and I want you to tell them the gospel too. You're not just going to hold it and, and for the Jews and keep it to the Jews. I want it to go to everyone. But the principle actually applies because Jesus, you say, did Jesus say anything about this? He did. You don't have to turn here. I'm just going to read it to you. But Mark chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, Jesus said to them, to some people that are asking questions about what they can eat, are you lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from outside, outside, meaning whatever foods you eat from outside, cannot defile him? Why? It doesn't go into his heart. It goes into his stomach. And then it's eliminated. And thus, Mark says, thus Jesus declared all foods clean. So now Jesus, who is God, is telling them, it's okay now. I'm telling you, all food is clean. You can eat whatever you want. And then we go on in the Bible into the book of Colossians, and the Apostle Paul says this to the Colossians in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or the, the drinks that you have in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, the substance belongs to Christ. So in the New Testament, God says that it, all these foods, all these meats are now available for you to eat. Just ask blessing on it and you can eat it. You say, but pastor, there's some groups that say maybe on certain days of the week only eat one type of food. That's actually not in the Bible. In fact, what we just read here actually tells us, don't let anyone sit in judgment of you and tell you you can't eat this or that or the other because of a spiritual reason. Now, your doctor may say, I don't want you to eat this for a health reason, but that's different than God saying you cannot eat this. Actually, Jesus said all foods are clean. You may not want to eat everything. If somebody offers me possum pie, I'm still not going to eat it. But, but that's for a different reason. All right? So God says all things are clean. So now let's, let's finish tonight. We've, we've done three questions, but let's kind of tie this up because this is really simple what we've done tonight. Many Bible questions are, are easily solved by doing one thing, reading the context. We saw that in Habakkuk. Very, very clearly, all you got to do is read that in context meaning reading what's before it and after it and getting the view of what's going on and many, many problems that people say they have with the Bible are cleared up real quick. A lot of them are cleared up. And so just, just remember that. One of the biggest issues is when people just take one verse and they come to you. Well, this verse says this. But what did the other verse say in front of it and behind it? And what does the rest of the Bible say? Remember I started in, with the, the first verse in 2 Timothy? All Scripture... That means everything from Genesis to Revelation, us as Christians, we understand the New Testament actually holds, pre if you would, it holds precedent over the Old Testament. So if the Old Testament says, hey, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth, but then the New Testament says, love your enemies, which one do you go with? You better go with love your enemies. Well, I'll go with love my enemies if I don't like, if I'm really not that mad, but if I really hate them, I'm going back to the Old Testament. No, 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 no doesn't work that way. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so New Testament has precedent over Old Testament, all right? And then we know it from Genesis to Revelation. If you know all of the Bible, the Bible, listen to me, it's very cohesive. There's no contradictions except in people's minds when they do not read from cover to cover. That's why I encourage you so much. Have your Bible, read your Bible through, know your Bible, because, because all doctrine, and by that I mean correct Bible teaching, comes from the whole of Scripture, from the beginning to the end, not just from select verses. So tonight we kind of proved that out, didn't we? Yeah. Pretty simple. These really weren't, you know, and, and I know the questions weren't presented to me necessarily because the person believes it, but they just wanted to, to, to hear it so then they can speak to others, and that's fine. But actually, 
if we just read through the Bible, a lot of these things will clear up for us. Now, in the coming weeks, we will discuss some more controversial things that sometimes Christians are going to disagree on, and we're going to do our best, again, to just stay biblical, to stay with the Scripture and see what it says. There are a lot of people that have, have ruined other people's lives by taking Scriptures out of context and putting them in bondage and putting them in a bad place. But God says, no, no, no. I, I, I've brought you into a place of freedom in Jesus Christ. And our lives are submitted to Him. What He says goes, amen? But if we know the book from cover to cover then we're going to be in okay shape. So with that said, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and let's just pray as we close up. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. I thank you for brothers and sisters that are here tonight. And Lord, we've, we don't want this just to be an academic exercise, not just like we're in study hall or something and we're collecting trivial knowledge. But Lord, we actually want to know your word because we want to live your word. And we want to be able to share 